Alrighty ho folks, so this is a video on Slim. Um, Slim's an interesting character to um, write about because there are quite a lot of techniques that you can bring into your answer that will help you score highly in that AO2 section of the mark scheme. So let's have a little look at perhaps one of the first things that you could mention about Slim. Okay, so remember, <clears throat> just as we talked about in an inspector calls, you have two different types of characters. You have a parallel character. Now, a parallel character is a character, as it says here, so parallel character. Now, this is a, that's an AO2 term, folks. That's an AO2 term for this prose answer. It's also an AO2, AO2 term that you can bring into an inspector calls. And we've talked about that in class. So, Slim is a parallel character in that he reflects the same characteristics as another character in the text. Okay, so with whom is Slim made parallel? Well, it, with George. Um, George is a character who reflects the same sort of morality and decency that Slim does. Okay, so then we have a foil. And a foil is a character that exhibits opposite characteristics. So who has not got the innate decency that Slim does? Who does not have the understanding of humanity that Slim does? Who is not selfless like Slim? Who is not brave like Slim? And your answer, let's say it all together, Curly! Okay, so George is your parallel character to Slim. Curly is a foil. He is opposite to Slim. So we could say that Slim is presented as a parallel character by Steinbeck, reflecting the same sort of decency, morality and understanding of humanity as George. And Slim is a character who is a foil to the insecurity, selfishness and lack of understanding that's exhibited by Curly. OK, so let's go on. Right, so we need to think about quotations that we can use to make our AO2 points clear. So this is the arrival of Slim. He moved with a majesty only achieved by royalty and master craftsmen, the prince of the ranch. So, as I say here, the arrival of Slim marks a, def a definite change in tone, okay? So up until, oh, that's a horrible colour, let's get rid of that, hold on. Definite change in tone, okay. So up until, up until the arrival of Slim... Everything about the ranch is harsh, it's critical, it's not in any way supportive, it's not in any way empathic. Remember that when Candy first met George and Lenny, he criticised them for being late. When the boss first met George and Lenny, he was doubtful and sceptical and he said to George, what are you selling? When Curly meets George and Lenny, he's already a threat with that idea that his, his hands are closing into fists. But when Slim arrives, we have positivity. For the first time, a character who is universally positive. There's an atmosphere of cool composure and we've got flattering comparisons. Now remember, Steinbeck's writing style is quite detached. Really, when he is writing, the only way that we're getting a clear sense of emotional engagement is through his use of adverbs. But here what we have, we have a movement towards more flattering comparisons and we have this metaphor. Remember, a direct comparison. So Steinbeck uses the metaphor that Slim is the prince of the ranch to mark the fact that Slim is a character who is seen in a, a universally positive way. He's the only one who is. George we have sympathy for George, yes, but he's not seen as universally positive. You know, he speaks harshly um, to Lenny in chapter one. He calls him a poor bastard. Um, Lenny, again, we have sympathy for Lenny, but we can understand how Lenny can be deceitful, how he lies to George about the mouse in his pocket, but none of those negative traits are linked to Slim. So he moved with a majesty only achieved by royalty and master craftsmen. So what AO2s would be take here? So Steinbeck changes his style by using flattering comparisons when describing Slim, moves with a royalty and a master. Uh, he moves 
uh, with a majesty achieved by royalty and master craftsmen. Why does he do this? Because he wants the reader to understand that Slim is a universally positive character, that Slim is different from everybody else on the ranch. And that difference lies in his humanity and his understanding of humanity. Steinbeck uses a metaphor to describe Slim. He is the prince of the ranch and it creates this idea that he is someone who has authority and authority that is deserved, authority that is based on something other than who his dad is. Remember, the two authority th- figures that we have met, bo- the boss, and he uh, he is an authority figure because of his status, because he's the one who's in charge of the ranch economically. <clears throat> then we have Curly and Curly's authority is vicarious. It's through his dad. But Slim, his authority is innate. It's about who he is, not what he wears or what his his economic status is. Now, when we're thinking about um, the idea of Slim being a foil to Curly, this is quite a good quotation to make that clear. He held a crushed Stetson. So the Stetson is the usual cowboy hat that you've seen in movies, if you still watch movies, I don't know, maybe they're on Netflix. But um, his Stetson is not an accessory or a means of affectation. It's not part of a performance. Remember that we said that um, Curly, he doesn't do any work, but he's got all the accoutrements or he's got the accessories of a cowboy. He's got the high heel boots. He needs those high heel boots to give him an authority. He's got the hat. But here we have the idea that Slim is authentic. He is he is the true ranch house man. He has a crushed Stetson. It's there because he's had years of use, years of experience, and it's made apparent by his war the worn exterior of that Stetson. So Steinbeck has the um or Steinbeck describes Slim as wearing a crushed Stetson, and through that adjective. And through the accessory that he is described with, we get the idea that he is an authentic ranchman. He is a worker with years of experience. He is not just putting on the performance of a cowboy, something that we could be or that we could attribute to Curly. Righty ho. Now look at these two different comparisons, or sorry, two different descriptions of Slim. They're both interesting. So what we have is the idea that Slim is the real deal and his eminence, now remember his eminence is made clear by that metaphor that he's the prince of the ranch but his eminence, i.e. his ability to be at the top of the social hierarchy here, his eminence and his deserved place there is because he is a man who is skilled and we know that from his crushed Stetson, his years of practice. So he's skilled in relation to ranch house work. But more importantly, he is a dignified human being. So first of all, in relation to his skill, he's capable of killing a fly on a wheeler's butt without touching the mule. Now, that sort of dexterity, that sort of skill, that's going to be something that would be praised and, and would be lauded by the ranch house men who are interested in such skill as that, capable of killing a fly on a wheeler's butt without touching the mule. But what we're interested in, perhaps as readers more so, what Steinbeck perhaps is more interested in, is the description to uh, that he gives that describes who Slim is as a human being, not what he can do. So this is a skill, this is what he can do, but this is a quality, this is who he is. His ear heard more than was said to him, and his slow speech had overtones not of thought, but of understanding beyond thought. Now, if you remember what Candy says, um, and to paraphrase what Candy says, when he talks about ranch house men, he says that they, they don't listen, um, they, 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 they don't listen and they, they don't talk. And what we have here, I go back and look at that quotation to get it right, and it's on my Candy PowerPoint, it's the one that has the double negatives, that would be the AO2. Um, point that you would make in relation to that but here his ear heard more than was said so unlike Candy who's scared of listening unlike other characters like Carlson and Wit who do not value the emotional connection that you gain from listening to another person's story 
what we have here is that Slim does. Slim understands that listening to a person is a key way of understanding who that person is. And remember, if we think about what Steinbeck wants to do in this novel, he, want, he for, for Steinbeck, that when you understand a person, it leads more to love than it leads to hate. So this is a novel about the, the need to understand. And that's not anything that anybody in the ranch places value upon, apart from Slim. Okay, So what you have here is Slim's qualities as a ranch house man and as a dignified, empathic human being make him a character of unsurpassable status. Remember, we've had him linked to the diction choice majesty. Okay, We've got that metaphor that he's the prince of the ranch. All of these things give, give him a status that cannot be beaten by anybody else in the novel. And if you just look at the, the fact that Steinbeck goes, um, that Steinbeck rather uses here, he uses positive diction to describe um, Slim's skill, which would be something that would be valued by the ranch house men, but positive diction and perhaps more detail to describe Slim's qualities, which would be appreciated by the reader. <clears throat> Okay, now this is a super bit of AO2 um, work that you can bring in for Slim and that you can bring in for Curly as well. So what we have here is that Steinbeck is making symbolic reference to hands. Now um, what we have here, think about how many hands are described in this novel. Okay, think about Lenny's hands. Lenny's hands are described like paws. You've got that animalistic reference to his hands as paws. And we'll talk about more about the significance of that when we do Lenny. Also, when you think about that really sad episode in chapter five, when Curly's wife is talking about what her, her dreams were to be an actress, to be in the movies, and she makes a little gesture with her hands and her wrist to show that she can act as if that would suffice. Then we have Curly. Curly and his fists and Curly with his glove of vase, his his glove full of Vaseline, which lets us know about his inadequacies, his inadequacies that he feels towards him, uh, that he feels about himself as as a, a husband, and that his hands are always clenched into fists, and Curly's pretty handy, so we've always got these references to hands. But here we've got some super references um to hands in relation to Slim. So Slim's hands are large and lean and were as delicate in their action as those of a temple dancer. Think about, already folks, we're getting so many similes linked to Slim. So the more descriptive language is linked to Slim and it's linked to Slim in a positive way. And therefore Steinbeck wants you to understand that Slim is different. When Steinbeck writes about Slim, he writes in a different way, a different tone, a tone that is universally positive. And that is to gain again to make him seem that he is prince of the ranch that he stands out that he has a majesty that he's different so look at this simile they were as delicate in their action as those of a temple dancer now think about the last quotation we had about him being able to whip off a fly so really what we have we've got a character who can inhabit two worlds we can uh, who can be um who can be understanding and dignified and can understand that the need for humanity to to have connections and to be heard and to be um and to listen to others and that perhaps is seen with that very subtle um those are all very subtle qualities i suppose but look at the the, the subtlety of his action that's described here delicate as those of a temple dancer um and those hands, hands that are capable of whipping are also hands that are capable capable of being delicate. And so really he is a character who has, as I said before, this sort of twofold eminence that he can be uh, a rough, tough man, but he can also be um, a quiet, thoughtful and dignified human being. He He's the best of the bunch. But <clears throat> here I've said that Slim's hands, hands are juxtaposed with Curly's. Slim's hands are described through the simile and Steinbeck suggests that the onerous qualities of ranch labour have no effect on the subtle, de uh, subtle delicacy of Slim. Like when you think about it, what's the effect of the hard ranch life on Candy? Well, he has his stick-like wrist. What's the effect of the hard ranch life on Crooks? Well, he's got that He's got the crooked back. He's bowed down. What's the effect of hard ranch house life on Carlson? Well, he speaks in very 
abrupt, rude, um, inconsiderate terms. What's the effect of ranch house life on Slim? None. Because he has a dignity that raises him above that, that hard ranch house life, which is about dragging people down. Here he has a dignity and an innate sense of understanding of who he is and what he is that raises him up. So his hands, like his spirit, are impervious to the brutality of ranch house life. Um, and I think that's really important. The brutality of ranch house life affects so many characters. We've just listed some there. But for, for Slim, he's raised above that because his hands, like his spirit, are impervious to it. He has an innate sense of dignity that makes him the prince of the ranch. Okay, following on from that, look at these <clears throat> two quotations. There was a gravity in his manner, or, sorry, a gravity in his manner and a quiet so profound that all talk stopped when he spoke. Now just look at that, all talk stopped when he spoke. So people stop because they know what they're going to hear it carries authority and weight. Sorry, I'm going to have a wee drink of my tea. Um, and it lets you know that there is an understanding, even among the ranch house men, there is an understanding that Slim is different. That Slim is is someone that they can look up to. And remember, when Candy is looking, when he is searching for some sort of escape in chapter 3 for his dog, to whom does he look? He looks at Slim. Looks for, he looks for Slim to make the situation uh, one that will offer salvation for his dog. Also, it's important here, Carlson stepped back to let Slim precede him. So even Carlson, a thoroughly unpleasant character, even Carlson understands that Slim has the importance that Slim is someone who should uh, precede him. So there's this gravitas in relation to the man, both physically and morally, and it's seen and felt. And I think that's important. So when you think about characters like the boss and particularly Curly, what do they have to do to enforce their gravitas? Well, what do they have to do to enforce their authority? Let's just think about Curly. To enforce his authority, what does Curly have to do? First of all, it's not his authority, it's always his dad's. But what does he have to do? He has to be challenging. He has to be aggressive. He has to close those little hands into fists. He has to wear the spurs. He has to wear the high heel boots. That's what he has to do to make people realise that he's somebody who should be paid attention to. What does Slim have to do? Nothing. He just has to walk into a room and talk will stop when he speaks. Carlson knows to step back and let st um, Slim precede him. So what technique would we say if we were, if we were going to use these quotations? So all talk stopped when he spoke. Um, Carlson stepped back to let Slim precede him. But what we've got here is Steinbeck is implying that the gravitas of the man is seen and felt by all. And that gravitas is in stark contrast to the accessories and the vicarious power that someone like Curly has to depend on. <clears throat> now, Steinbeck loves his adverbs, okay? But it's part of his writing style because his writing style is quite detached. So adverbs would be um, a key AO2 point that you might make in relation to... Um, Steinbeck's development of character but look here look here he looked kindly at the two in the bunkhouse now the adverb kindly is used for the very first time in the novel here when Slim is interacting with George and Lenny so sorry it's used for the first time to describe an interaction with George and Lenny here and it's used by Slim so the first person in this whole um, in this whole novella, to speak kindly to, to to George and Lenny is slim. Now that that's not just a fluke. That lets you know that Stein, uh, that Steinbeck wants you to understand that Slim is different, and he's done an awful lot of work up until this point to let you see that. So Slim's entrance opposes the harsh impressions that were immediately felt by the series of introductions which preceded it. Now I, I've already talked about how those introductions were made apparent. The introduction of Candy and of the boss, and of Curly. And uh, I, f sorry, I forgot to bring in Curly's wife there. Think about her introduction. Even before she speaks, she blocks out the light, and you've got the symbolic association there with that she is someone who's going to block out hope. Um, 
So what we have here is we have the adverb, AO2 term, adverb kindly being used for the first time by Steinbeck to describe an interaction with George and Lenny. And it lets you know that Steinbeck uh, wants Slim's interaction with these two characters to be markedly different. He understands them or he will grow to understand them more in chapter three, but he has an innate understanding that these two are together for reasons that are that are without cynicism or that are not exploitative in the way that the boss sees um, the relationship between George and Lenny. Okay, <clears throat> so do you remember what I said earlier about how Steinbeck wants to focus on the idea that if you understand an individual, it, it is more likely to go to love than it is to go to hate? Well, oh, sorry, I've, I've made a typo with guys, but hey, you can put the U in there. Um, here we have um, the idea that Slim understands George and Lenny's relationship without having to be told about it. He says, ain't many guys travel around together. Maybe everybody in the whole damn world is scared of each other. So he understands that George and Lenny's travelling around together is perhaps a way of defending themselves from the fear of loneliness um, that the other whole, sorry, that the whole damn world experiences. So Slim has an understanding of the human condition that goes beyond the ordinary experience of the ranch man. And Steinbeck's done an awful lot to let you know that he's not an ordinary ranch man. Think of the similes, think of the metaphor, think of the symbolism with the hands, think of the adverb that he uses in relation to George and Lenny, think of the fact that Crossan steps back um, to let him proceed, think about all talk stops when he spoke. All of these things let you know that he's not an ordinary ranch man. So the fact that he can understand this perhaps shows that he is omniscient. Now that word means all knowing. So they have this understand you have this idea that Slim has an innate understanding of of what humanity desires and what humanity fears. And this idea of him being godlike um is made apparent through imagery in chapter three and we'll talk about that. So the fact that he understands that maybe the whole damn world is scared of each other without truly knowing George and Lenny at this stage lets the reader uh, lets the reader um pick up on the implication that that Slim is an omniscient character who some he is someone whose understanding um goes beyond that of the everyday ranchman supersedes that of any other character um, within the novella. Now, <clears throat> um, I mentioned before about how Slim is associated with hands, the symbolism of hands. Well, Slim is also associated with sacrifice. And remember, the, the novella is building towards the ultimate sacrifice in chapter 6. And you know what happens in chapter 6. And if you don't, oh my gosh, what have we been doing for the past two years? But anyway... Um, what we have here is the first association with Slim and Sacrifice and there are three in the novella that we're going to talk about. So um, when we first encounter Slim and he's talking about his dog having puppies, he says, I drowned four of them right off. She couldn't feed that. I, she couldn't feed that many. Sorry, I'm going to have another wee syrup of my tea. Now, <clears throat> why is that important? One, it's the first time that Steinbeck associates Slim with sacrifice. Two, it shows the reader, Steinbeck is making it clear to the reader that Slim is a man who doesn't shirk his responsibilities no matter how unpleasant they are. Now that is foreshadowing what will happen in chapter six when George will have to, he will have to follow through on his responsibility. No matter how much it breaks his heart to shoot Lenny, he'll have to do it. Oh, says low battery. I might have to plug this in in a second, but let's see how far we can go. Um, so he will have to do it. So Slim understands that sacrifices must be made and that sentimentality cannot be used as a means of avoiding harsh realities. And when he makes this sacrifice with the uh, puppies, what he is doing is he is, his action is letting us know that 
a, a similar sacrifice will have to be made and it will have to be made in such realistic terms that sentiment cannot be allowed to trump what is the the necessary action what is the the action that is required and we know that that will be hard for George um it's unpleasant for Slim to do this but it has to be done and the reaction will be you know um, infinitely harder for George but he will have to do it with the same dignity that Slim shows us here okay so <clears throat> chapter three do you remember we talked about the omniscience of Slim that he has an understanding um, George looked at Slim and saw the calm godlike, calm godlike eyes fasten on him um, so what we have here is this simile in relation to slim and your simile is your AO2 term. So godlike eyes. So the godlike eyes link again to this idea that that slim has an understanding that is that is omniscient, that takes in everything, that he has an authority that is unquestioned. Um, he has a sense of morality that is apparent and the verb choice there. The calm, godlike eyes fastened on him suggests that there is a parallel between George and Slim, and that parallel is strengthened as we go through the no novella and made apparent most in the ending. But it lets you know that there's a connection between these two characters, and that connection is is forged on an a, a mutual understanding and a sense of trust and a sense of respect. These are two dignified people who understand that what they find in, find in each other is in a dignity and respect that is lacking in the ordinary reality of franchise life. George feels the guilt of his behaviour. Remember, this is when he talks about what he did with Lenny when they were younger. And it's to Slim that he confesses, perhaps feeling that Slim will understand, will not judge, but will understand. And George wants somebody to understand. Remember, that's the tragedy of George, that he is with Lenny, yes, but Lenny never understands George. Um, but Slim is different. Slim has the intellectual and moral um, intelligence that will uh, allow him to, to forge that connection based on understanding and respect. Okay, so... This is the second time that Slim is linked to sacrifice and this is in chapter 3. <clears throat> and here what you have is you have a melding of, of two significant <clears throat> themes or two significant motifs, sacrifice and hands. Oh, I have to have another wee drink of tea. <coughs> okay. So look at the quotation, Candy looked a long time at Slim to find some reversal and Slim gave none. Now, that very short sentence, and Slim gave none, really is the, the, the tolling of the bell for Candy's dog. We know that there's, there's no escape now. Um, now, the fact that Candy looked to Slim shows that there is that authority that's recognised by Candy and by rec recognised by all of the franchise men um, and that authority is innate within Slim and it shows that Candy recognises that authority and that the mercy of Slim are um, two things that he can appeal to but the short blonde sentence is quite shocking that Slim has made a decision and that decision is the same rational, realistic unsentimental decision that he had with the puppies what's it based on it's based on the fact that slim knows that sacrifice is needed by candy to stop the dog suffering so as harsh as it seems it is the right thing so he understands emotions um which is something that many of the ranch house men do not they do not understand the emotional like think about carlson when carlson uses his toe to point in the dog's skull as to where the bullet will go he's not understanding candy's emotional connection to the dog there um he, what he does is he completely one ignores it or two doesn't even realize it's there but what slim does is he understands emotions but he values doing the right thing more 
So he'll understand the emotion behind the drowning of the pups, but he values doing the right thing more. He understands the emotions that will be coursing through George when he has to shoot Lenny, but he values doing the right thing more. And doing the right thing is about stopping suffering, stopping the suffering of the dog here. So as I said before, three times he's associated with sacrifice. This is the second time. Now, I love this line. I think it's my favourite line in the whole novella. But it's the idea that when Candy's dog, when they sit in that silence, remember silence is personified. The silence comes into the room and the silence lasts, it stays. Um, but when they are waiting for Candy's dog to be shot, we have this phrase that Slim subdued one hand and held it down. Now just think about that. So he takes one hand and he uses it to hold down his other hand. Why? Why? Well, what we've got here is Steinbeck is using that little piece, that little piece of description to imply or to symbolise here this internal struggle that Slim wants to be able to stop the dog because on an emotional level he knows how much this is hurting Candy. He wants to be able to stop the shooting of the dog but he controls his hand. He controls his hand that he could lift and say stop and know that everything would stop. He controls his hand for the greater good. He understands that he must control his emotions just as Candy must his control his because the greater good is to, to end the dog's suffering. What Slim also does in this scene, which shows his dignity and his understanding of humanity, is he reminds Carlson to bring a shovel. Carlson doesn't think for a second to bring a shovel because he doesn't understand the dignity um, of you know, the dignity of the, that dog's life, nor does he understand or value the emotional attachment that Candy has to the dog. Carlson would shoot the dog dead and leave it. But he, he doesn't understand that that dog is something that could be valued and could be loved and is valued and is loved by Candy. So it's important that Slim reminds him to bring a shovel. Slim is the person who understands and he tries to use his authority to make other people understand as well. <clears throat> okay, so... Chapter 4, we don't really have Slim. Um, George has gone into town with Slim. <clears throat> And that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting union, a union that's, you know, has been on the cards since George and Slim had that lovely confessional um, episode at the start of chapter three, where we have the idea that these two characters are linked. Remember that Slim's eyes fasten on George and we've got this understanding that these two characters are parallel characters who share the same um, moral understanding who un who are aware of the dignity and respect, um, that should should go with being a human being, but <clears throat> in chapter five, after Curly's wife has has been killed, um, Slim has four important uh, moments, and we're going to look at those four important moments now. Okay, so the first thing he says is that Curly's still mad about his hand. Now, what we have here is that Slim has an understanding. He understands the psychology of Curly. He understands who Curly is and he understands how weak and selfish and egotistical Curly is. So even though when faced with the body of his dead wife, what will be behind Curly's vengeance isn't um, his dead wife, but still mad about his hand. So he understands that 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 attack on Curly's masculinity, that attack on Curly's ego, um, that attack on the only source of power that Curly can rightfully claim as his own, that will spur his vengeance upon Lenny more than anything else. So he has the insight to understand that the real source of anger and hatred within Curly isn't his need to um, have retribution for the death of his wife, but to have vengeance upon the crushing of his own ego and his own masculinity. Two, he says, I guess we've got to get him. Now, that little short statement is, is in terms of AO2, that's your use of Latote's deliberate understatement. What does it mean? It means, I, well, I think we'll have to go and kill Lenny now. <laughs> that's what it means. But he doesn't express it like that. He expresses it through the use of Latotes when he says, I guess we got to get him. And here we, we have that third 
link to sacrifice that he understands that um what will have to be sacrificed is Lenny and the the love that George and Lenny have for each other their relationship will have to be sacrificed for the good for the greater good so he delivers his he delivers his understanding in a way that is a fatal verdict just as we had in chapter three when Candy looked um to Slim for some sort of escape and that we had that little short sentence and Slim gave none here we have an equally tolling bell we know that there will be no escape for Lenny because Slim has said I guess we gotta get him and remember all talk stops when he spoke and his verdict is accepted um, what you have also is the idea that, well, why does he use Latotes? Well, he uses Latotes because he's conscious of the emotional uh, emotion involved. He's conscious of what he's actually saying to George and the impact that will have upon George. And so his language is subtle and his language is um, simplistic because he he does not want to um, heighten the emotional tension um, he understands the impact he understands the emotional toll this will have on George and it's completely in opposition to the bombast to the aggressive um, language of Curly and Curly's language is full of violence and aggression and selfishness um, and here you have the subtle use of Latotes by Slim to let George know that the ultimate sacrifice has to be made. In relation to making it clear why why they have to get Lenny, why the sacrifice has to be made, um, Slim uses animalistic descriptions to just dis- to relate to Lenny's situation. So he says, suppose they lock him up and strap him down and put him in a cage. That ain't no good, George. Now, there's your there's your, your animal reference that they put him in a cage. All the way through this novella, Lenny has been um, linked to animalism. So you've had that, sorry, has been linked to animal imagery. So you've had his paws and he is a bear-like man and he has such strength. All of those things that we have from chapter one up to this point link him to the idea of being an animal but all all those animal references are about animals that are free and here you have the idea of an animal in a cage and what Slim wants to do what he wants to make apparent to George is that for Lenny to be in a cage for Lenny to be trapped for Lenny to be punished like that it would dehumanise him Um, by referring to the idea of Lenny in a cage it shows us the complexity of the animal imagery in relation to Lenny because the animal imagery in relation to Lenny is used for two purposes to communicate to the reader his powerfulness but also his innocence and both of those things are made apparent here by um, Slim's description of what will happen and again you've got that Latotes that ain't no good George um, th- that simple little phrase um makes it clear it speaks volumes no one can live like that Lenny can't live like that you've got to act you've got to make the third and final sacrifice and the final thing that happens in chapter four sorry chapter five the four the fourth of my four points is Curly maybe you better stay here with your wife it would never enter Curly's head to stay with his wife because he doesn't have any sense of morality, he doesn't have any sense of dignity, or he doesn't have any sense of respect, he doesn't even have any sense of connection to her. Remember, what is firing his anger? Um, the fact that he's pretty mad about his hand. So Slim makes the suggestion, maybe you better stay here with your wife, because he knows that that would never enter Curly's head. Uh, it shows Slim's moral authority. It's sl- it shows that Slim knows t- to do the right thing. Curly doesn't listen to him. Curly has no understanding of morality. He values nothing but himself. Okay, so our final two slides on Slim. And this takes us to the third sacrifice that Slim's associated with. So unlike Curly, who immediately goes to inspect the body, um, and that's the body of Lenny in the end of chapter six, Slim comes directly 
to George and Steinbeck does that deliberately. So Steinbeck makes sure that there is this contrast between Curly, who goes to look at the body, and Slim, who goes directly to George. Why does he do that? Because he understands the emotional toll the sacrifice has on George, because he values values his George values George's humanity. It's really hard to say that he understands that George needs him. And what is really important here is that when Slim goes towards George, he sits close to George. And that use of proxemics, that use of distance, the fact that they sit beside each other, there is no distance between them, marks them out as characters who are parallel. The sitting together suggests equality and agreement and respect and understanding. And the closeness of Slim suggests their shared relationship of respect. Slim knows the sacrifice was necessary and agrees with it and sanctions it, just as he did in chapter 3. And again, you've got this subtle use of language. Again, understatement, Latotes, a guy got to sometimes. So Slim is associated with Latotes, understatement, subtlety of language, not harsh, aggressive diction that you have for Carlson and Curley, but subtle use of language, language that is about understanding, not about being heard. Oh, this is really small. I hope you can see it. But it's just the, it's just the ending here. So <clears throat> um, the, the last time that we see George and Slim together, um, I just done it. George said tiredly. Look at that adverb there. Tiredly. Tired of it all. Emotionally tired. Emotionally tired. Um, and then uh, we have, did he have a gun? Yeah, he had your gun. That's Carlson. Um, yeah, he had your gun. That's George. And you got it away from him and you took it and you killed him. Yeah, that's how. And George's voice, George's voice was almost as a whisper. Now, look at that. His voice was almost as a whisper. He's lying. He he's lying for the he's lying to safeguard his own position. George has lied many times in this novella, but he's always lied to protect Lenny. Now he's lying to protect himself. Um, he places his needs first, and that's the first time that George has ever done that. Put his needs before that of Lenny's, and so when he places his needs before Lenny's, when he lies to protect himself, his voice is he speaks tiredly. Adverb, you have that phrase that his voice was almost a whisper, um, and you can see the emotional impact that this action has had upon George. Um, <clears throat> and then it says, um, he looked steadily at his right hand that held the gun. And again, we talked about hands and the importance of hands. Oh, I've only got five uh, percent left. A bit of hurry. So he looks at his hand and uh, his hand there. Um, he associates with guilt. Um, and then Slim. Now, when George is looking at his hand, thinking about his own guilt, who takes him out of that moment? Slim does. Slim twitched George's elbow. Come on, George. Me and you'll go get a, uh, go in and get a drink. George let himself be helped to his feet. Now, that is the first time that George has let himself be helped. That is the first time that anybody has helped George and George has taken it. George has accepted that help. So what we have here is that Slim uses physical contact to console George, to, to wake it or to, to move him out of that moment where he's staring his hand and thinking of his guilt. You've got this role reversal because Slim is leading George away just as George once led Lenny. Um, and what that does is it gives us hope that these two characters can perhaps be in some or their, their relationship can in some way last the, they are two parallel characters they stand opposed and um against everything that Carlson and Curly represent um so Slim says you had to George I swear you had to come on with me and he led George into the entrance of the trail and up towards the highway led him up perhaps there's a bit of salvation there a bit of hope in that little image at the end twice um, Slim is associated with leading there. He let, sorry, he led George into the entrance and he let, uh, George let himself be helped to his feet. So if we think that he, think of your, your verb, he led George and George let him um, help him to his feet. And it gives you this idea that the, the physical connection between these two is also representative of the emotional, psychological connection between the two, that they understand the situation that they're both in. Um, and ultimately, you have hope that their relationship can continue. 
and you had a George, I swear you had a three, to, uh, sorry, twice he repeats that phrase, you had a, that colloquial phrase. And again, it's understatement. It's letting George know that he's absolved from any guilt, that what he did was the right thing. Um, so think about Slim. He's a great character to write about. Uh, usually, um, if, if you're thinking about Slim, you can really get into the complexity of the man and how he represents something different on, on the ranch. And that's us done. Yay!